Well, welcome everybody and thank you for your interest in this webinar, Into the Outdoors and Away with COVID-19. Um, thank you, Lisa, for introducing us. Um, and I'm very happy that my colleague, Rachel Dernley, who is a very good friend, um, as well as being an earliest consultant in the UK, is with us today too. So hi, Rachel. Hi, Mary, and hi, everybody out there. It's so exciting to be here. So um, welcome. Great. Well, we're here in the southeast of England, and would you believe it? It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining and it's 80 degrees, which for us is hot. So we're loving that. Um, and it's so exciting because we have colleagues and friends, both from South Carolina and other parts of the States, and from the UK and even from South Africa. So it's really nicely um, international. We really hope you're all well today and that your families and colleagues are too, because there's no doubt that this COVID-19 has been a real shock and a challenge to all of us. Um, and here in the, I know in South Carolina, I'm so sorry, you're having a hard time at the moment. We've been through it in the UK in April, which was like our peak. Sadly, there were 40,000 deaths, and I think at the moment we're well over 45,000. So um, everybody has been really suffering, and nobody more so than the nurseries. And those of you who are joining us today, we really feel for you. Um, because it's been so hard for you to stay open through this period and I know in the US there have been webinars about how do we support you in this. Um, we're really happy to um, have the opportunity to share you videos of barn kids in Chiddingfold in Surrey and Rachel and I had a glorious morning there um, when we actually did the videoing. Um, and we're just hoping that it might be, um, you know, just, just some source of reassurance and or inspiration for you if you haven't already opened your nursery, um, or you might just be interested in what's happening across the pond, as we say, in the UK. We also have a lovely example of a proposed outdoor area in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is in a disadvantaged area, which is being created from scratch. So um, I think for Rachel and I, the really the silver lining of COVID, if I, if I can be so bold as to say that, because I know it's so terrible, is actually outdoor learning has become authenticized by governments, both in the UK, the US, and I read something about South Africa. So whereas before, um, you know, we would go on about outdoor learning and people would go, oh yes, nice, you know, and I could see that smile on their face of, well, you know, it's, that, it's a bit cottagey this or whatever. No, actually at the moment, this is the way forward. So um, hopefully you will learn something from this. So let's, with no further ado, have a look at what, what today is going to involve. So our plan for the webinar is, um, does, it really, um, does it really matter about getting children outdoors? So we're going to revisit theory and practice. And then we're going to talk about how our setting in the UK has adapted the outdoor provision to the COVID-19 situation. And then we're going to look at Spartanburg and a practical example of the proposed outdoor development in area of urban disadvantage. And then at the end will be question time. So um, because I see at the moment we've got um, almost 50 people have joined us, um, it's going to be difficult to answer questions during the um, webinar, but at the end, if you would put whatever questions you had on the chat screen, we'll try and answer as many as we can today and promise you that any we don't get to answer today, we will um, answer on the ICS website. So Rachel, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Lovely. Thank you very much, Mary, for that introduction. Um, I hope it's given you a good idea of what we're actually trying to get across to you today. And that is that um, it's okay, it's all right to go outdoors. 
and the videos that we've done of uh, Laura and uh, Tracy uh, in the Forest School at Barn Kids, hopefully, as Mary said, will give you lots of reassurance. But we wanted to start off today uh, just giving you a, a kind of a reminder, or it might be, you know, actually information for you to um, base your decisions on, that actually it starts with play and getting outdoors, um, getting your children outdoors. It's actually okay because children will play anywhere and when they play they learn and you know play for children and, and for adults as well it's all about isn't it it's all about joy and wonder and seeing the wonder and the awe of the world um, it's fascination for children it's uh, and it's disappointment as well isn't it um, and frustration and all of that is play because when you're uh, frustrated and you're disappointed with things that you're doing perhaps you persevere perhaps you have ideas and do you know all of that fires up the brain and the brain is an amazing organ and all of the play that children do the things they smell the things they touch the questions they ask when they're doing that that actually stimulates the brain brain and fires up neurons which then creates loads and loads of connections all through the brain. And that is what we want to see when young children are learning. Um, and it's through learning that children find out what they can do and, and how they can do it. And we do know, don't we, that those children who haven't had good opportunities to play in life, um, they, they just don't necessarily find out what they're capable of. But the main thing is, isn't it, that as teachers or parents or whoever we've got out there, I don't know, we might have grandparents, uh, aunties, uncles, whoever you are, when you're interacting with children, what's happening is that you can see that they're persevering, having ideas, focusing, achieving their own goals and having a go, having a real go at something and wanting to have a go is, is really important. And when we see all these things, then we can confidently say, yes, these children are motivated to play and investigate. And therefore, I can be really confident that they're learning. And so learning can happen indoors. It's fine, isn't it? Children still learn indoors and they still learn outdoors. They'll learn anywhere. So the fact that we have COVID amongst us at the moment, you know, maybe it's the time when we should be thinking, mm, it's safer to get them outdoors where the germs are less likely, sorry, the virus is less likely to be spread. But there's one more component that, along with play and the environment, that really does make learning happen, and that is you. And um, that's the added extra to all this, these lovely things that they're doing. And when you communicate, when you play with them, when you um, you watch and wonder with them and discover with them, that really is the very best kind of environment for a child to learn in. And I, I found this uh, little slide and thought, oh yes, this, this will do nicely, thank you, because actually getting children out into the open air and into the woods or the forest or by the river or wherever you're going, even if you're just out in your backyards, if children are connecting with nature and we're their role models for that, then it really can contribute to the stewardship in adulthood. And that's that little quote on the right hand side of your screens, I think. And it's um, getting children out and really connected in nature. You know, if you think about um, how worried we are about the sustainability of the planet at the moment, then it has to be a good thing that we get them outside anywhere outside and enjoying it and discovering and learning and there really are true benefits to having time in nature and you know you can see that at the bottom of the screen you know better social skills um, better behaviors because children relax and adults relax when they go outdoors and somehow the routine just kind of happens outdoors it's not it's not um it's not being forced on children indoors to get through, you know, the snack time, the nappy changes or the diaper changes out there in the States. And, you know, it gives children more self-esteem, stronger emotional connections to people and nature. And all of that, apparently, and as research says, 
improves their grades. So you have to ask yourselves, um, really, why wouldn't we get children outdoors? But there's one more thing that I want to add to that, um, and, and that is exercise. Exercise is really important for our children. Um, not, not only because it's, it's healthy, it keeps us, it, the body ticking over, um, carries oxygen around the body more, improves lung and heart functions, but it, it just works better for the whole body if children exercise and get into the outdoors. And I've got some interesting facts for you, which um, when Mary and I read these many years ago, we got quite excited, didn't we, Mary? And, and, and we've been advocating these facts for quite a few years now. But the first one is that children experience a really strong desire to move. And that's because they need to move in order for development to happen. And this is the interesting bit. When you move or when children move, it releases dopamine. And dopamine is that lovely chemical in your body that makes you feel really happy, alert, um, invigorated, and therefore it wants you to do more. It, it wants your body to do more. And, and I've got this vision of you know children in my head who start to run and then they run some more and then they chase and then they run more and more and more and go round and round in circles, having just an amazing time with their friends. And there, here's the next interesting fact is that when the children run around and round like that, there's a chemical in the brain called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. But don't worry if you can't remember it, it's not a problem. Because what that's doing is when you move, it's firing up, it's reacting to those movements and firing up the brain to produce more neurons and more connections and millions and millions of connections. And the more you move, the more this chemical is released. Um, and so there's a big warning here, isn't there, that um, children have to move for brain growth. And being sedentary doesn't produce the same amount of BDNF. And therefore, learning happens best when you move. And sitting still is just about the worst way to learn things and I think this is something that we really need to know and be aware of, particularly with our very youngest children, where they have this innate desire to move, and yet we send them to school at four and tell them to sit still, to listen, to, um, you know, not to move, not to run. And all their bodies are saying to them is, run, 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 move, move, move. So I think we have to be really careful um, that we're giving our children enough time to move and be outdoors and where possible be outdoors in wonderful nature and so the third interesting fact i've got for you is that vision um, doesn't develop properly and fully unless you move your body in a 3d environment and being in a buggy or being in a car seat it, it doesn't do it it's not the same they have to be children have to be moving through a rich 3D environment so that their eyes can track the movements. And that makes the muscles in the eyes grow strong. But again, when they move, their bodies are telling them, their muscles, in fact, there are messages coming from their muscles going up to their brain, telling them where they are in space and uh, uh, giving them that feeling of, of balance. And so those are two senses which Mary's of going to mention a bit later on. So really, the biggest message here is that physicality, moving and exercise are at the heart of learning. It's critical for young children and it's at the heart of child development. And for it, it's, it's really important for children to move in order to build, um, to progress and child development to happen um, holistically. So again, I'm going to say being outdoors is a place where children can move in so many ways and tackle so many different terrains. Why wouldn't we get our children outside when we can? And um, here we are with a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, she said, uh, doesn't say when she actually said it, but she said, I think at a child's birth, if a mother could ask a fairy godmother mother, to endow it with the most useful gift, that gift should be curiosity. 
And as I said, you know, curiosity really um, is at the heart of learning as well, I, I feel. Um, because, and this is a, a, a quite a nice little, um, it's from an article that was written by Bruce Perry called Curiosity in the Fuel of Development. It's quite easy to find on the internet if you've got to go and read it. But what he says is that curiosity really is at the heart of learning. When we're curious about something new, we want to explore it. And while we explore it, um, we discover. Um, and I'm thinking about that child who, uh, the little toddler who finds the uh, light switch um, on the wall and they press it. Wow, they press it and something happens, cause and effect. And uh, the light comes on. And that's wonderful. And so because they pressed it and they found out that the button does something, they press it some more. And lo and behold, they get a flashing light. And, um, and so it goes on. As they repeat, as they feel pleasure, they repeat those actions. And that then leads to mastery. You know, they've got the hang of the, uh, the light on the wall. So let's go and see what other buttons I can find around the house. And that's, you know, it's all those um, uh, things that they want to do that we don't actually really want them to do, but we have to kind of go with it, but make sure that they're safe. So they've got this mastery over the skills and then they learn new skills. Maybe they go off and find other buttons and that gives them confidence, which leads to self-esteem, a sense of security and therefore more explanation. Mm -hmm. So I want to just link that to very quickly to the outdoors. Let's just think about, uh, you know, if we're in a field or in woods or by a river, all of those things that are out there that will um, uh, st stimulate children, that will encourage them to go and uh, use their curiosity and, and explore. And I'm thinking about, you know, the trees blowing in the wind um, in the autumn, uh, the leaves are on the trees one day, they're off the next day. Um, and, and, and you get this Aladdin's cave on the, on the forest floor. Um, stickiness of mud when you add water to it um, and how hard it is to mix that. Um, melting icicles on a winter's day. All of those wonderful things that are out there that you don't have to take out there. They cost you nothing. All you have to do is get your children into nature. I'm going to hand over to Mary now. He's going to talk about uh, why resilience is so important. Thank you, Rachel. That was really interesting. Um, yes, I found it really interesting um, during these COVID times to observe how the adults and children whom I thought would deal with the pandemic with confidence have been really fearful and timid and the um, adults and children whom I thought, you know, would have reacted badly to their new circumstances have been very calm and sanguine about the whole affair. And that just got me to think about this and to wonder, is it something to do with the resilience factor? So resilience is the ability to adapt well to adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of stress. And undoubtedly, this time has been a huge source of stress for all of us. Being able to bounce back from the aforementioned. And interestingly enough, it's not something that children have. So, you know, some children are naturally athletic, some children are more artistic, some are more sensitive, and it, that's innate. No, resilience is actually a skill that children develop as they grow. And in order to grow resilience, children need certain conditions. And one of them is, you know, time in the natural world. Um, the other obviously is, um, you know, empathetic adults, um, but also adults who will let them um, have a go and risk taking, which I'll talk about later, movement, which Rachel has already spoken about, and then using their seven senses. Now, we all know about the five senses, but let's just for a little while talk about the other two. And I'm sure most of you um, know all about the proprioceptive and the vestibular sense, but never, it's never any harm just to repeat. So um, if we look at, um, you know, the, um, 
oh goodness, I've lost my place here. Um, some, looking at um, the proprioception is how people actually, um, the brain develops so that we know where we are in space. So it's like walking up or walking down steps. And children and adults just naturally learn this through the brain development. And, simply, and also the vestibular sense is the balance, it's the middle ear. And sometimes um, you, you will see children spinning around like tops. And we as adults are like, oh my goodness, they must get so dizzy. But in reality, they are just um, developing the sense. And the really interesting thing is that um, children need to have a really keen um, vestibular sense to be able to sit still. And really this vestibular sense develops sometimes only by the age of seven. And when do we make our dear little ones go to school and sit at desks still? Well, in the UK, it's four, and I've kind of seen that in the US as well. So I'm now going to talk about nature deficit disorder. And Rachel, perhaps we could have that slide. Thank you. So nature deficit disorder, or NDD, states that human beings, especially children, are spending less time outdoors, resulting in a wide range of behavioral problems. So a lack of routine contact with nature may result in stunted academic and developmental growth. And this is an unwanted side effect of the electronic age called nature deficit disorder. And as Rachel previously mentioned, the chemical in the brain called BDNF only really happens when children are out moving. And, and this chemical is so vital for memory and learning so that when you move, you're learning and where better to do this than in the outdoors. And so Richard Louvre, in his landmark work, Last Child in the, in the Woods, brought widespread attention to the alienation of children from the natural world. And um, I would just like to point out that nature deficit disorder, it's not a medical condition. It's a description of the human cost of alienation from nature. And we're going to now go on to risk taking and um, I promise you, this is the last theory, because I know you're all thinking, when are they get, going to get on to the fun bit? So just to talk about risk taking, um, there's no such thing as zero risk um, childhood. And um, it's a myth about zero risk taking or zero risk setting. Children really need to learn how to manage their risks and challenges they encounter in everyday life. Risk is part of being alive. I mean, you've all taken a risk getting out of bed this morning and maybe driving your car or going on a bicycle ride and, and Lisa and Rachel and I were talking about going for a walk and they were all, you know, that's kind of risky, not terribly, but nevertheless, um, we're all taking risks all the time and babies would never learn to crawl or negotiate steps or stand up and children wouldn't learn to run or ride a bike without taking risks. Um, an interesting um, study has been made and it shows that children who learn in their early years to make their own reasoned decisions rather than simply doing what they're told to by others will be in a stronger position to resist the pressure they will inevitably face as they reach their teenage years. And we all know the compliant children and I know even myself as, a, as an ex-teacher sometimes you know you'd say oh yes you know the children are all good they're all very compliant and that kind of makes it easy but is that really what we want do we want children who will just always do what they're told never question things never have a go so
I beg your pardon, at risk benefit analysis, which is balancing the risk against the benefit. So for example, crossing the road, the danger is high, but the lack of getting hurt is low if we put in good strategies of teaching children how to cross the road safely. And with no further ado, I'm going to hand you back to Rachel and we're going to start looking at the um, videos. Thank you, Mary. So um, here we go on the very exciting bit. We are excited to be showing you these videos of barn kids in Surrey. And uh, I rather hope that um, Tracy and Laura Jones, who's the owner, and Tracy, the manager of barn kids, are sitting at the other end of this because I think you're, rather, you're going to rather like what you see. Um, but just very briefly, just to uh, give you an idea of um, the setup at Barn Kids, um, Laura Jones is the owner and she took over um, the, the, the ownership of the nursery, uh, I think it was about three years ago. And uh, luckily for us, uh, we became involved as advisors. Um, and to be honest, we've known Barn Kids for many many years in our role as local authority education advisors and uh, so obviously we've been working with them and seen lots and lots of changes but uh, i think we, we we can honestly say that the changes that are being uh, made um, especially through covid actually are are, are wonderful so uh, the, the building itself has three three separate buildings, standalone buildings. The first one is the called the nest, and that's where the babies and uh, youngest toddlers are, if you like. Um, that's where they are, and it has its own dedicated outdoor area. Um, then you have uh, I don't want to describe it as a hut, but I, I guess it is. But it's a lovely large hut, uh, and uh, and it's called the chicken run. So I imagine it was. Um, in a previous life, a chicken run. And then we have the barn, another uh, hugely beautiful building, um, which has the preschool children, and again, a dedicated area. And I should say that the chicken run had a dedicated, has a dedicated outdoor area as well. Um, previously to COVID, uh, mainly the preschool children went out to forest school. Forgive me if I'm wrong on this, uh, Laura, but I think it's, um, two or three times a week and of course that's now changed so um, and we're going to look at that in a minute but um, all the outdoor areas are well developed um, for each of those standalone buildings as well so uh, it's very much uh, has an outdoor ethos um, just very briefly background to forest schools they started in Scandinavia in 1950 came to the UK in the 1990s and a lot of um, schools and nursery schools are um, taking on the, the ethos. Uh, they're run by qualified practitioners, level three, and they have uh, a, um, uh, sorry, a child centered pedagogy uh, where children learn about managing risk and care for the, the natural world. So, without further ado, here is the first video, and Laura is going to talk to you about the forest school itself. Laura, how lovely to be here today. Um, thank you so much for having us at Wonderful Barn Kids, which Rachel and I just love. I'm going to throw it right over to you. Would you introduce um, Barn Kids and tell us just a little bit about forest schools because there may be some people viewing who don't know anything about Barn Kids. Yeah, um, so Barn Kids is a beautiful nursery set in the Surrey countryside. Um, we have a maximum of 74 children every day between the ages of 0 to 5 before they go to school. Um, we start getting them outside early, so when they're babies we go out and we have um, off-road buggies and we take them out into the fields. Um, and then they start their journey from there really. And so they go through the nursery and as they get older and more capable and more competent, then they start doing different activities and taking different risks. Um, in regards to forest school, so forest school is all about spending a lot of time and engaging with nature and being outdoors. Um, and it's about taking, allowing the children to take risks according to their age 
and capability um, and it's about the children forming that relationship with nature um, and being confident to use the things in the environment rather than toys and plastic and, and different things like that. Wonderful. So Laura, um, you know, explains nicely the concept of forest schools and how the children um, are learning to take risks and use the resources in the environment with confidence. I think the next slide, you, we will see more of the Dutch bar, as it's called. Um, Laura, one of the focuses, obviously, is in this very sad time, the pandemic. And we'd just love you to talk us through and show us round um, what you're doing to counteract um, measures of COVID. So yeah. shall we start having a little walk around? Yeah, so um, uh, basically what we've done is we've reduced our class sizes. And, and so we've separated our, uh, our classrooms into smaller groups. Right. Um, and then we've moved our preschool outside um, and so this area here, which is the Dutch barn, we've made into an outdoor classroom. So the oh, children wonderful. that are in this group don't actually spend any time inside. Um, no time at all? No, not, not at all. all. Well, um, and then we've introduced hand washing okay. is um, a, a big part of the routine. I think I can see a couple. Shall we go and have a look? Yeah. So we've made hand washing stations. So the children will come in here in the morning um, and actually it's great for independence they're actually originally we had them outside and the parents would wash hands with them now they come inside and wash hands originally we had them outside and the parents would wash hands with them now they come inside and wash hands on their own um, and they just go over to the hand washing station and then we also they wash their feet as well um, and then Wonderful. they come into the outside area so this is the classroom that we've got and this pod is called owls um, and so we associated all of our pods with different animals um, and they've really taken on the owls idea um, this is our planning board, so we, we do this inside, so we've now got our planning outside. Okay, sorry, we're going to have to apologise that that cut out a bit sooner than we expected, but actually what you, you've missed is um, just showing us around the Dutch barn and some of the activities that they've got as, as a kind of holding base, if you like. And uh, as Laura pointed out, they don't actually stay there for very long before they're on their way and off up to the, um, the forest. So um, uh, what you, I just wanted to talk about the hand washing station um, because she was, Laura was talking about um, the fact that the children wash their hands um, in the Dutch barn, but there, you couldn't see any water. And that's because the water is actually uh, supplied from um, two large flasks. And uh, obviously it's not there because the children have gone up to the, the forest school, but you will see them later on in the, um, in the forest itself. So without too much ado, and I'm hoping that the, the video won't cut out this time, but um, if we do have problems, um, there is a recording of this, um, of, of all the videos on the ICS website, so you can catch up if you want to see the, the whole version. But fingers crossed, let's try the next one, which is um, how do we get to Forest School? Sorry. The children come straight in. Uh, what time do they arrive? Between eight and nine in the morning. And they go straight to the Dutch barn? Yeah. And then how long do they spend in the Dutch barn? Not very long at all. We aim to get them out within 20 minutes of their arrival time. So each pod has an arrival time, which reduces the number of parents here at any one point. Mm -hmm. And then we aim to get them out within 20 minutes of them arriving. So we'll so, make sure that they've got suntan lotion, hat, 
yeah. um, long trousers and long sleeves okay. um, just because of the tick risk in Surrey countryside um, and then they'll get on their way and come out to the forest. And the parents go as far as the Dutch barn, do they? Yes. And turn straight round and yes. after dropping their child off. Yes. So they don't actually go into the, no. the nursery area, as it were, in the Dutch barn. No, and um, we've actually found that it, handovers are much easier. Now we do it outside. Yeah. Um, and the children just go on their way very, very quickly, actually. And that's why we moved hand washing to inside the room. So then they sort of have that to focus on. They leave yeah. their parents and, uh, yeah, it works really well. Excellent. And no cases of COVID or no suspected or...? No, no, wow. I think we've had, we've had one member of staff go for a test right. and who had a sore throat and cold back symptoms, but apart from that, no. OK, so here we are in the distance. There it is. You've got a bell tent? Yeah, the bell tent is for our two-year-old children right. and they use that for privacy, for nappy changing and then for their sleep time. Wonderful. And that little sort of porter cabin thing before, in front of us, what is that? So that is that's our, that's our temporary toilet. toilet. <laughs> um, because we've increased the number of children, right. um, we need increased toileting facilities. So we have a self-composting toilet on order, but oh. they take about six weeks. So okay. we had to improvise and bring in a Brilliant. portaloo. <laughs> Brilliant. The field is looking wonderful too. Right, so, oh, thank goodness um, the video worked. You'll see that um, that was quite a, a walk from the Dutch barn to the forest school. Um, one of the practitioners kindly actually gauged it for us and she said it was about 500 meters. So that's, you know, if the children walk 500 meters there and 500 meters back, that's a thousand meters, plus all the running around they do there. Um, and thank goodness, you know, despite um, there are there were low numbers of COVID in Surrey, um, we still are very alert and, um, you know, always keeping ourselves safe. But it's, it's good to see that there were no cases in Barn Kids. Now I think we're going to go on the part that you've all been waiting for. So let's hold fingers, everybody, that this next slide will work and this is your first glimpse into forest school menus and wrote on our blackboard and then we added <laughs> some toys and equipment
So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we wanted to give you a little sneak preview before we kind of get into the forest school in depth. But um, I mean, I think you can see there, can't you? The, the children were playing and playing in different ways and, and uh, showing curiosity and exploring. And you know, that, that goes back to the first slide when I was talking about how children play and they don't need much to play with. But we also saw the wonderful, wonderful environment that they're making use of and how natural it is and how they make use of natural things like logs um, and the, 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 the mud itself. And, and, and of course, the one thing that really excited Mary and I about this particular video is the interactions with the staff, between the staff and the children. And what we generally find is that when we go to forest schools, that we see something, something happens to the children when they go outside and something happens to the adults and everything seems to just kind of relax and calm down. And wasn't it wonderful to see the staff really being with those children, being available, giving them time, talking to them, uh, playing alongside, you know, the, 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 the um, young male practitioner, how wonderful his, um, his language was when he was uh, naming the dinosaur eggs and the acorns, and I think they were finding up dinosaur eggs. Um, but those, those adults were so available to those children, and the, that's the very combination that we're looking for to help children to learn. And, and so we saw curiosity as well, didn't we? Which is absolutely what's at the heart of learning. But above all else, what we saw with the adults was um, how they communicated, how they model language, how they show, how they explain things, how they demonstrate exploring ideas, encouraging, questioning, etc. And that really is the very heart of how we teach in early years. And you could see it there being done so naturally and in such a relaxed way. It, it, it was a, a, a really enjoyable scene for me and Mary. Um, and, and just a word of warning as well, that what the things that we didn't see were, we didn't see any don't do this, don't run, don't shout, don't climb, don't swing. All we saw were children being encouraged. And a big word of warning is that disapproval really can kill curiosity. So just be aware of that. Okay, so the next video, um, Mary is interviewing um, Laura again um, and asking her about how she's adapted the outdoor area to, to take into consideration the guidance um, on COVID-19. Laura, we're now in the forest school, which is so wonderful, and we can hear old MacDonald being sung at the back, which is very appropriate. Would you like to tell us now how you have adapted your forest school to the COVID-19 and what you have improved upon from the last time I was here? Uh, so, to be honest, what we've done is we've embraced what COVID has meant to the nursery. So prior to um, COVID occurring, we had about 10 children that came out to forest school every day. Um, and the children who came to nursery would take turns in it being their day. Um, so actually COVID has given us a real excuse to actually move everybody outdoors. Um, and so now instead of 10 or... Um, apart from the babies, yeah, everybody. So when we used to have um, 10 or 15 children out here every day. We now can have upwards of about 45. 45? Yeah, out in the forest every day. So what's that, that's meant is we've cleared some of the areas to make a bit more space. Um, we Over here we've got the um, younger children's area. Um, we have delineated this with the straw hay, with the hay bales. Um, and they aren't as um, aware of not mixing between the groups so we've created a, a special camp for them right and um, the first week there was nothing in this camp and actually the team and the children have built it together um, so they've brought things down they've put tents up um, you know really interested in climbing so they've put ropes between trees they've started off quite low and they will get higher as the children become more competent um, and then for the older children who are over this side um, of the forest, 
we've separated them into two camps so they have two special areas that they use as well so the badgers will use one area in the week and the owls will use the other and then they might swap round depending on the children okay. yeah. so it's it's really good to um see how laura says they've actually embraced what COVID has meant and that has given them the opportunity to have all the children outside um, and whereas they just had small groups before and they only came out two or three times a week now they all come out all the time and it's lovely to see how delighted and confident she is in their vision and ethos for the children. Now I know a lot of you most probably looking at this saying oh wow that's great but how could we ever do that and um i think really and truly you know we need to be thinking about outdoors generally and how even if you've only got a concrete playground or a small strip of land what you can do and um you know staff who are inspired and working with the children, I have seen some incredible things in areas that you know you would you would write off almost. So let's go on looking at this now, and we're going to look at the environment. This is kind of our working area, to be honest. So this is where the food will come into. This is where we do our hand washing. So this is quite a busy area at lunch times, for example, or Indeed. snack times where we operate out of here and then get the food out to the children. Um, so you've got your drinking water, your water canisters, your cool boxes, all that different type of thing. So um, it's a bit of an administrative area, really. And, and do you try to maintain social distancing or what happens in that area? No. <laughs> oh, between adults, we try and maintain social distancing. So there's, the team work with their pod and only their pod. Oh, could you tell um, us about a pod? Yes. Uh, so we have separated all of our nursery children into pods. Okay. So the preschool children will go into a pod between 10 and 15. So they have owls and badgers. Mm -hmm. um, and then in our toddler space, the pods will be between 8 and 12. And we have squirrels, hedgehogs and foxes. Um, and then our smaller children, our babies, will be in pods of six. And we have ducklings and bunnies. <laughs> Um, but we don't do social distancing. Children yeah. can't socially distance. Absolutely. Um, and so the best thing that we've done is the hand washing routine. Indeed. Um, and they hand wash regularly. And um, we also do take their temperatures at different times of the day oh, just right. to monitor okay. monitor that. And then being outside. That um, is the huge advantage yes. is the outdoor area. Yeah. So uh, just before we talk about the video there, I just want to, to reiterate, uh, we were talking about children's social distancing and, and we, we realised that children in the United States, depending on where they are, they may be required to social distance, even if it's against their normal nature to do so. But um, here in the UK, uh, we're, I mean, I think Laura is still taking a really good stance on um, uh, how she copes with um, interpreting the guidance, if you like. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that we have quite low figures in Surrey at the moment, and we hope that carries on. Um, I think, you know, it's about risk taking and, and assessing the risk and bearing in mind that they haven't had any cases and I'm going to touch wood there for, for us all. Um, I think, you know, that she's taken this stand very sensibly. So I just wanted to point out uh, in the bottom right hand corner, I think that is on your screen, that they, there you can see the flasks that they take the water out in. And, and also the fact that, um, I don't know whether you saw, but the, uh, the hand washing stations have all been made out of uh, builders pallets. And uh, I'm sure you can get those free. They're, they're certainly free from builders merchants in the UK. And uh, you can adapt them to make more or less anything you want. So uh, that's a bit of a top tip there. Um, interestingly, the children have all their meals out there. Uh, they have a catering company that delivers them and they're brought out to the, uh, the forest school in a buggy, which Laura has, uh, was part of her initial outlay. 
Um, and they eat in the forest. If, if you saw in the uh, last video, there's a, a circle of logs and they either choose to sit on them and put their meals on their knees or they can kneel down on the grass and, put, and use the logs as a table. And uh, Laura and Tracy have both commented on how, how independent and how inventive the children are over meal times and you know, how it's not, it's not a problem for them to wait because everything seems so much more relaxed out there. So now we're going to take a deeper look in the forest and uh, there are three camps and we're just going to take a little look at the roundhouse camp. Got sort of danger out just because the handbrake wasn't in the right place. Tracy, so <laughs> tell me how have you actually developed all of this and um, I see lots of new exciting things. Yeah, so we've been, um, so there's, there's a base of a camp here anyway but since we've been coming down here with a bigger group, they've developed it further. So we'll just go up onto the bridge. Hello. Hello. Good morning. How have you come? So, so since um, they've been coming more, they've added more areas and more things, and the children have been working on building on the environment so now we have a mud kitchen oh. and they've what have you been making in there willa i've been you've been hammering but now all the water has gone has all the water gone so maybe we could spoon it and make molds with it do you think we could do that should we take it up there and you can find some shapes the molds they made their own menus and wrote on our blackboard and then we added <laughs> toys and equipment and eyeballs and eyeballs that's great So we've been talking about Room on the Broom this week, so all our activities have been focusing around the story of Room on the Broom. So they've been making potions and spells and, and broomsticks. We had broomsticks one day as well where they made, they bought, got their own twigs and put leaves on and then they flew across the field. And here's an example. Oh, look at the broomstick. <laughs> where is the witch's stuff? And then they've been, this is their focused activity today. So they've been finding natural um, elements to make their birds from the room on the broom. They've done really well actually, they've loved it. Yes, boy. Well done, Evie, you having a drink? We're doing some water. So we're now, we've showed you the other areas they can do. I'm not sleeping. They've made some dens and some camps over the week. <laughs> hey, this is exciting. It's like your dinosaur. <laughs> and then this is our fairy garden. So they keep adding to it. So we've got a dinosaur cage now, which is from their interest and from what they wanted to make. So they found the sticks and they've been weaving. Dinosaurs even ended up in the pond. Yeah, and I see you. Um, you had maths involved there with the numbers. Yeah, numbers on. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh. Wonderful. Look at that wonderful house there with the door and windows. Clay yeah, so they've used clay, they've used wood pebbles, they've used wood, they've used the ferns from the um, area around us. Yes, and as that's a terracotta pot, it's a chimney pot that one of, our, one of our staff brought in to, to, to use. Yeah. Oh. And I think, I think actually maybe the chimney pot it was a project she did when she was on furloughed. Oh, wonderful. So your staff are always busy. <laughs> 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 
I think that's the end of that one. Um, I think it was really good to see how, as Rachel said earlier, the staff were interacting with the children and um, to see that the children are being listened to and owning their own space. And if you were just to look at, you know, that clip, you'll see that all sorts of learning is going on there, physical, imaginative, mathematics, literacy, you know, right across the board. Um, and very interesting to see how the me menu um, was written by the children and their emergent writing. And um, the mug kitchen, of course, is always a big hit. And there was that obsession with eyeballs. But I think the thing that, that is most interesting is that the staff are really facilitators rather than teachers. Um, Maria Montessori speaks about directresses and they, they, they facilitate whatever the children want to do. So, you know, with the room on the broom, um, whatever particular activities that they were interested in, it was taken and extended. And um, that's really what we want to be doing. So um, the next one is that thorny question of what do we do about the weather? I get it. <laughs> right, well, there's one big question, whether we be in Surrey, England, or in South Carolina, or in South Africa, and that is, what do you do when the weather is really inclement? We have different options. We have to take into consideration high winds. So for example, if there's high winds, they have to be away from the trees. So they may do an activity in the field, or they may come down to the barn. Um, thunder and lightning, they have to leave. So they would come down to the Dutch barn and do activities. Cold, wet, we're just out in all weathers. And it's the clothes and the equipment that we have that makes it suitable. Brilliant. And the children actually really enjoy being out in the rain. They do. So there's some of the days where it's really wet and really miserable. Yeah, and, and I the... like muddy puddles. You do like muddy puddles, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think, oh, it's cold out, but the children just love it. The children do love it. Um, uh, but we're very lucky here at Barnkids because we do have and the Dutch we barn. And mud pies when it's So raining. the Dutch barn is cold when it's very warm. Yeah. And it's warm when it's very cold. So that also gives us an element of shelter as well Brilliant. if we and, um, and marching, walking and being energetic Absolutely. is a good way to stay warm. And, and also it's the clothes. So it's having the clothes to change into when we Indeed. get back so they're not sat in wet clothes. It's layering up so they have lots of layers. So if they're cold they have them on and as they warm up they take them off. And it's having the right waterproofs yeah. as well. And Albie and Will, would you like to show Rachel what, what you're wearing? I, I can't remember. What do you call those that you've got on your feet? Wellies! Wellies, of course! <laughs> so, um, uh, it was lovely to have our two little boys, Will and, and Albie, there, um, who rather stole the show, I thought, but that, that's their prerogative. Um, so Albie, just to explain, is Laura's uh, middle son, and she has obviously three sons. Uh, Albie and her, uh, I'm really sorry, Laura, I can't remember your, your little one's name, but they're still at the nursery, and the other son has, has gone to Mary's remembering. It, isn't it? Thank you. Um, uh, so the eldest son is now at school. So it was lovely to have him with us as well as Will. But um, of course, you know, we have different um, weather systems in the UK, We're generally quite wet and, and uh, cold and, and the warm weather is a real joy for us. Um, but we're, we're aware that in South Carolina that, you know, you're probably advocating the use of hats and ensuring that children are hydrated all the time and have sun cream and that kind of thing. So, um, and, you know, of course, we have that old mantra, which everybody's familiar with, there's no bad weather, just bad clothing. And I think Tracy's illustrated that really well in this video. And just a, a little story for you um, that uh, I think Laura told Mary that uh, apparently one morning Albie came into the kitchen for breakfast and said his tummy was hurting. And Laura asked what he thought it could be. And he said, it's the white blood cell soldiers in my tummy 
fighting the coronavirus germs out of the mouths of babes and how lovely that at that age they actually understand the biological processes that uh, go into making you well. So lovely little video there. So the next video um, we are asking, or I am actually, um, asking Laura about the ad has there been any adverse effects on the children of COVID-19? So we've, uh, we can absolutely see here that the, the wonderful effects that the outdoors is having on your children. We've seen them digging, being so physical, using their imagination, etc, etc. Are there any other, uh, were there any particular adverse effects that being in the woods has had on your children? Um, so, no, I don't think there are any adverse effects of uh, being in the woods with the children. I think from COVID and being closed, um, I would say that children coming back into nursery, some of the children we would have expected to have been potty trained at that point weren't. We don't know whether it was a result of COVID or not, but what we do here is we do, when we see the signs of children being ready, um, we work with parents in partnership to help drive that forward. Um, and so, you know, that may have been lacking during lockdown, but apart from that, you know, the children coming back to us are calm, settled and really excited about being back and playing with their friends. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I'm sorry, the wind that Tracy alluded to started to get up there, so the sound wasn't as good as perhaps it could have been, but um, I think you got the general drift. Um, and it's just interesting that, that, you know, as Laura said, there were very few adverse effects, but one of them was the children's independence. And I think off camera, she also spoke about things like, um, putting their shoes on and um, so you know maybe the children the parents had been helping the children a little bit more and certainly with toilet training it had maybe deteriorated but but that was minuscule compared to all the benefits so sadly we're coming near the end of it this is the last um, video and this is just Rachel asking Laura about what top tips she may have and unfortunately in the middle of um, filming this the phone rang so um, there might be a little jump in it but I think again you will get the general gist of what's happening. So Laura we've had a, a brilliant to move with that and they need to recognise in the children their interests and things that they want to do and be prepared to go with it and take risks themselves. So would you say it's about being um, bold and yes. fearless of doing things wrong because right. we're all human and sometimes we get things wrong don't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then I think also you don't need shiny expensive to do it what you need to do is you need to have a, a good mind about how you can adapt things in the environment to use yeah. um, and you'll see from from around here so the hay bales for example we needed a natural barrier and you know we we looked at the natural environment and figured out what we could use um, and we do that a lot in forest school we recycle we upcycle you know we we beg borrow and steal bits from here there and everywhere to and I can see you've used kind of, you know, logs and sticks and rods and all the, the, the natural things that you've got around you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, while you were creating this wonderful place, specifically for your children in COVID, what are the most...
main, what's your main outlay? Tents, really beneficial because we actually then can transport the resources um, around the nursery. So drinking water, hand washing water, food, everything that the children need we can actually bring down here. Yeah. Um, but apart from that we haven't really had any other huge expenses because we've yeah. used the things around us and you know parents have donated pallets that we've used into things so you know we haven't had a huge expense. Brilliant, well that's what it's all about isn't it? Working with what you've got. Absolutely. Okay. So um, quite a nice little video, I, I apologise for the sound on that, I do hope that you were able to get the gist of what was being said but um, Laura was talking about uh, how important it is to have a good team um, and, and a, a, a staff team that are flexible and willing to take calculated risks and you know to be bold and fearless and not worry about getting things wrong um, but going beyond that and, and having ideas that you know could, could en um, enhance the environment um, and being outdoors um, with children really is quite dependent on having staff who also share a love of the outdoors and nature and in, in our many years of advising nurseries and, and trying to encourage them to, to be outdoors more, um, both Mary and I often come across this barrier um, that staff just don't kind of want to be out there. But I think, you know, in the last few videos, you know, Laura said, um, you know, that uh, sometimes she doesn't want to go outside because, you know, it's wet and it's horrible, but the children don't care. They actually want to get out there. And it's important that, you know, we realise that it's us sometimes that create those barriers, not, not the weather um, and, and not, not the risks. So something to be aware of, I think. Um, and uh, so the, the little cut, which you might not have seen in the video, um, I asked Laura what her main outlay was. And she said that the bell tent was the first one. Um, but the buggy that carries all the equipment out to the nursery was the other one. Other than that, they've literally, I guess the toilet, the composting toilet might be an outlay as well, but she didn't mention that in the video. But otherwise, everything that you see is, has been brought in at minimal cost. Um, and as she said, you know, they beg, they borrow, they find things and, and have a look at them and see what could be done with them rather than, you know, throwing things away. You have, I, I used to do it when I was in nursery. I'd look at something and think, I can't throw that away. We must be able to do something with it. Um, and out of that, she's created this wonderful environment. So, um, so what, but, you know, we're, we're looking at really good practice here. You know, Laura and, and Tracy have created this wonderful forest school. But, you know, what if you don't have that? You know, what, what, what can you do? So I think um, it's about really getting back to basics and having a look at what you've actually got. Um, what can you make use of? And, and also, uh, perhaps it's a good time to reflect on your outdoor areas or indeed to even explore what might be available to you beyond your outdoor area. You know, is there a park nearby? Is there a river? Perhaps you're near to a lake, I don't know, but maybe it's worth just investigating what could be. Um, and also, um, it's about reflecting on what you've already got in your outdoor areas. Does your, you know, think, maybe ask yourself a question, do, does my outdoor area change? Do we still have the same things out there every day? Um, and if so, are the children doing the same things? the same, um, do they react the same way with what they're playing with in the outdoors? It, in which case you have to think, well, how are these children making progress if we don't ever change it? Are we stagnating their progress? So I think our message to you is to come away from thinking of the outdoors as time for, I think you call it recess out there, we call it break time or play time. And, and really start to embrace and enhance what you already have to keep your children outdoors for longer and maybe even outdoors all day. Um, work with what you have. Seek knowledge and inspiration from others, which is what Mary and I have done for many, many years now, because we like to be at the forefront of what's going on out there. Um, 
And you, don't forget the internet. I'm sure you're all using it, but there's masses of information on there. Network with other people. And indeed, we, we put um, Laura, Laura's uh, Barn Kids website up there. Take a look there. There's, there's plenty to digest. And I'm sure she wouldn't mind an email or two from you either if you wanted to ask questions. Sorry if that's not correct, Laura. <laughs> so um, let's now move on to, uh, I think it's Spartanburg. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So let's see Mary. Yeah, um, thank you, Rachel. It's really exciting. There's a new project being developed by First Step Spartanburg, and I'm very honoured to be helping them with it. And it's being managed by Caitlin Watts, who's the Family Engagement Coordinator, a very dynamic young lady. And um, First Steps has received a substantial grant from First Steps South Carolina to develop an outdoor learning project in the Spartanburg area. And lovely Barbara Manofsky, who is the director of Spartanburg, has the vision to attempt to alleviate nature deficit disorder in the more disadvantaged areas of Spartanburg. So what you see on the screen, it's a very draft plan of an outdoor learning area, which um, Caitlin and I put together. Um, it includes a mud kitchen and a digging area, a wildflower sensory garden, an um, open grass area for free play, loose parts, building blocks, tree stump stepping stones, bushes for the um, picking for the mud kitchen, etc. Um, and what we're really focusing on is it we want to develop high quality outdoor learning at a minimum cost so that the materials have either been donated or bought at a very low cost. And, you know, this is something that, that we're really focusing on is that um, we just as um, Laura had been saying in, in the past um, video, um, really, we, we need to be looking at um, what we can do with as little as possible. So once this is developed and established, we're actually hoping that it's going to be an example of best practice for um, practitioners and students in the Greenville Spartanburg area and indeed maybe the rest of South Carolina could come and see it. Um, we want it to be somewhere where you can visit and experience outdoor learning in practice. Um, and once it is completed, we will um, put, you know, we'll put more details on um, the website. And I actually had um, an email from Caitlin just last week to say that they are in a meeting with two prospective sites. So, you know, it's great. This is all going ahead despite, you know, COVID and, and all the um, restrictions that that had put on things. But um, I promise you that once I know more about it I'll keep you up to date. Um, now the next slide is entitled um, Shopping for Outdoor Playscapes and I know you know sadly um, it's always been a struggle as um, early years practitioners to have money. I mean you know we, we've always been struggling and never more so than now because it's tragic, but I think in the UK, we're talking about maybe 25% of our settings not opening again. And I know ICS has been working very heavily on this too. So everything always has to be done um, with a, as little expense as possible. So you can see here, um, Caitlin devised this for me. So the um, materials could be found on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist and you'll see the sink that they got for um, the mud kitchen was $30 on Craigslist and bless her she was so excited about that and I'm so excited for her too but maybe even they could have got one donated but who knows but the buckets and bowls they've all been donated and um, you know everything else there so um, this is really, you know, an important um, aspect of um, this. And 
Um, the one thing I will just say to you too is, you know, Laura spoke so much about how wonderful her team is. And I know, and Caitlin and I have spoken about this. And really to get this going, we need to have staff who are engaged, who are passionate about it. But we also need to get the parents involved too. And having worked, you know, with different forest schools in the UK, it was interesting because it was always the naysayer parents who quite rightly were worried about health and safety and um, hygiene and all the other things. If they got to actually experience outdoor um, play with their children and go into the forest, they very often soon became the born again um, outdoor learners. So, um, you know, just something that we need to think about. Um, I think that just about wraps this up. So, Rachel, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you, Mary. So yes, you're right, it does kind of um, wrap it up and, and we call this the roundup slide. And really just want to just have a little think about what we have actually talked about. And we've talked about play, the environment and, and you as the adult being so important to children's learning and how, how beneficial it is to get outside because it boosts your energy, um, it's good for your vision, it boosts your immune system, you know, children get more vitamin D. And because of that, you know, we have heard, haven't we, um, certainly in the UK, that vitamin D is right now is really important in building your immune system to recover or fight off uh, COVID-19. Um, also, um, you know, we, we saw those children in the videos and, and all of them were so focused and, and attentive. And uh, research has been done, which says that, you know, that children's attention spans really do um, build up nicely when they're outside um, and in fact there's a study of children diagnosed with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder ADHD and it found that children with ADHD who spent significant time outdoors exhibited fewer symptoms. We know that um, the outdoor is good for well-being I you know um, certainly for me you know when I get out into nature and you know we've all had to haven't we on lockdown you know, we're scrabbling at the door to get that ex that one hour of exercise that we were allowed in the very beginning of lockdown. And when you got out there, what a joy, even if it was raining, just to get away from the four walls, gave you um, that, that um, uh, security of going back and knowing that, yeah, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. And of course, it's easier to exercise outdoor and uh, Certainly over here in the UK, we have um, a problem with childhood obesity. I'm pretty certain you, you have that in the States as well. So, you know, makes sense. More exercise, uh, you burn more calories, less likely to have um, problems with obesity. So um, really, Mary and I, we really hope we've got this right for you. But we, what we wanted to do, and I hope we have done, is provided proof that children really like being outdoors. They can sleep outdoors. They're able to occupy themselves with very little resources. Um, and alongside that, the very best resources um, are the interactions between uh, the adults and the children and the children with their friends. And that's what makes the difference to learning. So our message to you, I think, finally, is be confident in what you know is best for children and be confident in what you think and do. Be bold and creative in establishing ways of getting outdoors safely with your children and be flexible and fluid with the outdoors. It, it's time to take, um, it's time, sorry, it's time to take um, the opportunity to reevaluate and rethink your vision and ethos. And when Mary and I have gone into settings who are struggling a bit or a bit tired with their practice, we go right back to, well, what is it that you want for your children? When you see them leave the practice and go on to school, what do you want them to look like? And I can honestly say that all we've had to do is ask that question. And it may, might take time, um, but certainly the vision, you can see it coming through and that the, all the adults in the team understand, when they understand that vision and ethos, you really do build a practice that's uh, 
full of good practice and full of outstanding practice. So what we want you to do as well uh, as our parting message, if I may, is to say, please hold on strongly to the fact that child development is what it is. It is not a race. You can't make it go any faster than the biological processes that need to happen to help children to develop. But what we want you to do above all else is put your trust in children, put your trust in yourselves to support your children to be the most amazing people that we know they can be. So finally, um, we just uh, put three videos up there that um, we think complement really nicely what we've been talking about today. The first one, how do children learn best, is a really nice kind of a summary of how children do learn best. And they talk about play and how important it is and how important it is for children to move. The second one, the changing nature of preschool, is about a, a kindergarten, nature kindergarten in Seattle, um, which has got even more examples of uh, the environment and what they do. And then uh, back here over in Scotland, we have uh, a tour of um, Claire Warden's um, outdoor area. And I'm not even going to try and pronounce that word, but I think it's Auckland. Um, yeah. Auckland, okay. Um, and uh, Claire Warden, again, a really nice one to have a do a search on because she has a, a website called Mind Stretchers with masses of wonderful resources that would hopefully inspire you a lot. Um, and then we have a suggested reading list. Um, this is going to all going to be up on the ICS website, and I believe that there are even more uh, resources for you that are going to be put up there. Um, sure. Yeah, so Lisa's taken care of that for us. Thank you very much. And so now I think, yeah, here we go. Uh, we're ready for any questions. Can I just ask Lisa, how much time do we have for questions? We have seven minutes and we have a few. Sorry, Lisa, you've gone on to mute again. Sorry about that. Okay, now we have six minutes um, to <laughs> questions, and I have also put in the chat window um, some links to ICS publications, blogs, and white papers that we've written about outdoor learning and forest schools. So let me get to the questions. The first one, this is a note to Mary. Uh, Meredith says we are planning to reopen in August with as much outdoor learning as possible and still hoping you can visit our program at Furman sometime. Absolutely, Meredith. I'm so excited to see that you were on um, today. And yes, I would love to come to Furman to see your outdoor learning and, and hopefully we can discuss and maybe I can help you. But yes, that's definitely on. Okay. Julia asked about kids in poverty and sick kids who might miss out. She's afraid they may miss out on this learning opportunity. So how would you encourage the parents of kids with asthma and allergies? Oh, uh, just thinking this one through. Um, I guess it's about being in contact with the managers at the setting and you know the managers and the owners working with those parents to reassure and you know um, I'm just thinking you know they might have uh, if you had asthma or allergies they certainly have what we have over here are care plans um, and obviously those needs would need to be revisited to ensure that you know it, it's it's okay for children to go outside and um, you know knowing what the allergies are uh, before uh, they go into the forest is you know, really critical. Very and I suppose also, you know, having their inhalants, etc. So just being really prepared, um, but trying not to alienate the children from from the rest, shall we say? Because um, you know they really want to be part of it. So um, it it's tough. Um, and hopefully, you know, in, in the Spartanburg um, work, we will be looking at things like that too. So that's a, you know, good question. Okay. 
From D, she asks, have you had to deal with COVID-19 directly in your forest school with children, parents, or staff? Hi, D. It's so good to see you. I saw you there. Um, we, we found that um, you would have seen on the video that they haven't had any children or staff with COVID. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that, that a lot of, of others have. Rachel, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, unfortunately, I haven't had any experience. I, I mean, I know a number of settings, I think uh, nine settings that I, that I visit on a regular basis. Uh, most of those in Surrey, one in Hampshire and one in West Sussex. And, you know, none of them uh, are experiencing, as far as I'm aware, too many cases of, of COVID itself. So I think, I mean, I don't want to tempt fate, but I think the, we are very lucky that the figures were high in Surrey in um, March, but they really have, I haven't seen the latest ones this week, but certainly last week from the website that I keep an eye on, there were only, I think there were only 17 cases in the whole of Surrey and we have, you know, 1.1 million population. So, um, yeah. I think one of the sad things there, and I think we alluded to this earlier, is that an awful lot of settings just haven't opened for a whole plethora of reasons. So, um, you know, from that perspective, and, and that's why, you know, we're so grateful to Barn Kids for actually um, letting us video there. And, you know, it was difficult for them. They did have to change their... Um, risk um, policy and um, they took a big risk in having us there that day but um, they were prepared to do this so that we could share all this information so you know big shout out to barn kids for and thank you for letting us do this absolutely thank you from the bottom of our hearts barn kids yes okay we have two more questions um two minutes so is the outdoor area in Spartanburg for a child care center or is that a community outdoor area? Um, um, yes, it's going to be a community, but um, they're actually going to be um, looking to start with a child care and then building up. And I'm sorry to be a little bit vague about this, but um, they, they were going in one direction. And then as with life and with COVID, things slightly um, shifted and so Barbara and Caitlin were very kind and they let me still talk about the Spartanburg um, outdoor area but I promise you as soon as we have more specific details we'll be on to that because I'm excited about it and I think it would be very good for the um, Spartanburg Greenville um, community. Okay. And from Sherry, she wants to know, what are some strategies to get buy-in from parents and educators to implement outdoor learning environments and early childhood programs? Okay, well, um, I, th I think it is actually really talking about, as we've been talking about today, you know, there are, there are so many benefits to getting um, children outside. And I know sometimes, you know, parents are a little bit reluctant about, you know, what's going to happen out there. Um, you know, is my child going to be safe? That's a huge one because the area isn't necessarily um, marked off. You know, uh, they rely on, uh, you know, sharing the rules of the forest school and children know absolutely where they can go and where they can't. So I think about it, it's about really communicating with the parents and telling them what it's going to be like even showing them one, I mean, they could, could they perhaps watch this video online um, on the ICS website um, and, and weigh up the benefits for themselves um, against the risks? And I think I spoke about how um, I worked um, with a forest school and it, this was way back when forest schools um, were really new in Surrey and it the, um, there was a, a wonderful article in the Daily Telegraph and the lady who owned and ran this um, forest school, she actually had a meeting with all the parents and um, 
sort of told them all about it. And there were all the anxieties as we've spoken about already. And she was lovely because she said to the parents, um, I'm here and I'm prepared to do this for your children. Oh yes, because the parents had said, well, what about, are you kind of almost hot housing our children that they're going to get all this wonderful experience now? And then when they go to big school, as we call it, or formal school, they're suddenly going to have to sit at desks, et cetera, et cetera. And this lady was lovely and she said, no, my job is as far as you're concerned is for um, early years, but once your children go to, um, you know, more formal education, you have to inspire the um, powers that be. And it's really interesting because in summary, um, forest schools have worked from the bottom up, you know, normally everything cascades down, but actually in Surrey, and now you'll find that almost every primary school has some form of forest school learning, and even the secondary schools or the high schools are also following suit. So it's not easy, but it's the Chinese drip drip effect that does it. Okay. Um, we have one more question. Does Barn Kids, do they have an open, open days for parents to come along and have a play so that they know how their children are interacting? Oh, I wish Laura was here to answer that one. Yes. <laughs> um, do you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but um, I'm pretty certain that they, they would do. Um, do you know, Mary? No, a uh, uh, good question, because I know other forest schools that they do and and the parents can actually go along and participate. Um, <coughs> why don't we find out from Laura, because there's no point in us answering and I, I can almost see Laura sitting there going, yeah, whatever. So we'll find out from, put it on the website. Would that, would that help? Yes, it would. Um, I'm trying to think. There's someone here, Amelia Pettis. I don't know if she's from Barn Kids. There were a few people that registered from Barn Kids. Um, but it could be Amy. I wonder if it's Amy because I know um, she is one of the pr practitioners. Mm -hmm. Or Tracy. Or Tracy <laughs> type it into the chat line yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and she's in the Clemson area. No, she's not spam kids. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, that is all the questions that we have for today. And um, let's see, here's someone. Okay. Yeah. Amy yeah. Tolliver, she's not. Not for kids. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that is it for today. Um, let's see, another chat. Any recommendations for resources of outdoor learning for elementary age groups, six to 10? Oh, is, it, is that my... Yeah, out of our remit. Not to five-year-olds. So do you know what? I would, I would still go and look at the Mind Stretchers website in the UK and get some ideas. Um, but to be honest, I think it goes back to saying, you know, there are no recommended resources. It's just what you've got, what you find. You know, we've, we see forests with old tires, with um, crates, with planks. Um, you know, so that children can build high and wide. So, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I and know. and sort of den building. You know, um, and I've, I've been noticing that in where I live, it's very um, a forested, and it's just wonderful to see the children who've obviously, um, you know, are, haven't been at school are, are making all these fabulous dens in the forest, and it's literally just from branches and and whatnot. So, um, you know, that, that's something, and that goes back to Boy Scouts and Cubs and that who do that. Um, so, but sadly, six to 10 is not really our area of expertise. Okay. Well, there are no more chats and we're a little bit over. So um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. It was very informative, encouraging, and um, 
I just thank you. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank else. you. It's been a wonderful experience. And, and it was lots of hard work. And we did have a lot of trauma about technology. <laughs> but somehow we seem to come through it. And thanks to Lisa, who was our guiding light. Absolutely, thank, thank you very much. Can I just say a final thank you to the whole team at Barn Kids? Totally. Um, I hope you enjoyed watching yourselves. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Bye. Bye.